the, the, the fourth speaker today, uh, who is Lauren Feldman, Associate Professor of Journalism and Media Studies in the School of Communication and Information at Rutgers University. That's on the Newark campus? New Brunswick. New Brunswick campus, okay. Uh, Lauren's research is on media effects in political and scientific contexts. The effects of partisan media on public opinion about climate change, the portrayal of climate change in satirical news programs, and how the media coverage of climate change influences public engagement. It's exactly what we need at this point. We've talked about individual initiatives and government initiatives and industrial initiatives. The media mediate it all. The talk is called Communicating Hope and Fear in a Context of Climate Emergency. Lauren. All right, thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for that introduction and, and for inviting me to participate here today. I know that this is the final day of the summer school and that you've all heard from some amazing scholars over the last couple of weeks. And so I'm very grateful to also have the opportunity uh, to talk with you all. Um, and so my talk is going to focus on how media and communication can encourage the general public to take political action and support policy change to address climate change um, and the role that emotions, particularly hope and fear, play in that process. Um, and some of the ideas that I'll talk about today will connect with what you heard earlier in the week from Connie Rosa Renouf, but I don't think there will be too much overlap. Um, and so the role of hope and fear in climate change communication have, has been a topic of significant debate among scholars, journalists, and activists. Um, for example, journalist David Wallace Wells has argued that the reason people um, are not more involved with climate change is because people are not scared enough. Um, his 2017 cover story in New York Magazine, which he later adapted into the book, um, The Uninhabitable Earth, laid out the worst case scenarios for climate change. Margaret Klein Salomon, who's the founder of the Climate Mobilization, which is an activist group um, that promotes climate emergency declarations by local governments, has argued that the public needs to move into what she calls emergency mode, characterized by a laser-like focus on addressing the existential threat posed by climate change. And, and she argues that the climate movement can help um, get people there by conveying the horrifying truth of the climate crisis, in other words, by evoking fear. Um, and of course, Greta Thunberg and, and other youth activists have used um, rhetoric designed to evoke fear, for example, when she famously implored world leaders that our house is on fire, that she wants them to panic and, and feel the fear that she feels every day. Yet others have argued that people already are scared and what they need to translate that fear into action is a sense of hope and optimism that they can do something that makes a difference. Um, in the US, the percentage of people who are classified as alarmed or concerned about climate change is larger than ever. Yet, the US public on average are not taking political action. So in 2020, only 13% of US registered voters said that they had contacted an elected official in the last year to urge them to take action on climate change, a number that has held, held relatively steady over the last several years, despite rising public concern about climate change. Um, and, and Jennifer Marlin, um, in, a, in a 2019 uh, study that she and her colleagues conducted, they found that among U.S. adults who believe that global warming is happening, um, when asked what makes them hopeful about climate change and about addressing climate change, about a quarter said that they don't feel any hope or they don't know what makes them hopeful, um, suggesting that what the authors refer to as a hope gap among the US public, um, which may be due to the fact that people are not hearing enough in the media about current efforts to address climate change. Along similar lines, um, Krasman and colleagues um, in 2019 conducted a study also in the US that explored people's perceived feasibility of taking different climate actions and the perceived effectiveness of those actions for actually addressing climate change. Um, and they found that individual actions, personal behaviors like recycling or driving less, as well as voting and contacting public um, officials, were seen as relatively feasible, but ineffective for addressing climate change. Whereas collective actions and government policies to reduce emissions were seen as relatively difficult to implement, but effective. 
And so their findings suggest that, that climate change messaging needs to stress the feasibility of collective or governmental action while also emphasizing the effectiveness of individual contributions to those societal actions. In other words, people need information that provides them with hope and efficacy. And so it may be that people are not more politically engaged with climate change because they lack hope in the, in the sense that there is any reasonable action um, that they can take to address climate change. Um, and so this, this so-called hope gap may mean that those who are already alarmed or concerned about the threat of climate change won't necessarily take action to address it while further alienating those segments of the population who are doubtful about climate change. And so as an alternative to fear-based messaging, some climate change focused media are emphasizing solutions. Um, for example, How to Save a Planet is a podcast hosted by Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson and journalist Alex Bloomberg that focuses on efforts to solve the climate crisis. And it, and it showcases people and groups who are actually making a difference um, and, and ways that listeners themselves can get involved. And so for example, recent episodes explained how Biden's, Joe Biden's jobs plan can help the climate um, and the host actually modeled to listeners how they can call their congressperson to advocate for climate action. Um, another episode focused on how Amazon employees organized um, to push the company to act on climate change and it described the wins that they experienced as well as the challenges. Um, more broadly, the solutions journalism approach to news reporting on social issues like climate change, um, which is championed by the Solutions Journalism Network, encourages journalists to focus on effective solutions and explains and explain how people are actually responding to problems rather than just the problems themselves. Um, and there's some evidence that solutions-based stories can increase people's engagement with news, their sense of efficacy, and their motivation to take action. Um, both the proponents of fear-based and hope-based messaging seem to be suggesting that a key reason why people are not more engaged with climate change is due to a lack of emotional involvement in, in some form or another. Um, and my focus in this talk is not necessarily on which type of emotion or emotional appeal is better, which I think is the wrong question, um, but on what kinds of media messages can evoke hope and fear and what role these constructs can play in motivating activism. Um, and I'll primarily be, dis be discussing um, my own recent research on these topics. Um, but before I do that, I wanna start with a, a brief overview of, and conceptualization of fear and hope. Um, fear and hope are often treated as discrete emotions. Um, and so discrete emotions are internal mental states that occur in response to some stimulus in the environment. Um, and they have unique appraisal patterns, which refer to how people evaluate the stimulus in, ter the stimulus in terms of their own personal well-being. Um, discrete emotions also have unique subjective experiences or feeling states, um, as well as unique action tendencies and physiological changes that can guide future perceptions, cognitions, and behaviors. And, it, and it's those action tendencies that make discrete emotions a, a potential mechanism for persuasion. And so from this perspective, fear um, is aroused when a situation is perceived um, as threatening to one's physical or psychological self. Um, the adaptive function of fear is to protect oneself or to avoid potential harm. And so its action tendency is to escape from the threatening agent, um, which can lead to avoidance behavior or it can motivate action to reduce the threat. Um, and fear has been um, fear and fear appeals have been been studied extensively, um, and meta analyses suggest that fear appeals and so fear appeals are persuasive messages that attempt to arouse fear um, by emphasizing the potential danger and, and harm that people will face if they don't follow the messages recommendations. Um, and so meta analyses have found that fear appeals can have a positive effect on attitudes, int intentions, and behaviors. Um, especially when efficacy information or information about what people can do to avert the threat is included. Research on, a, on fear in a climate change context um, is, is a bit more mixed. Um, there's some evidence that fear can be mobilizing, um, and, um, but other research raises concerns that fear-based messaging can trigger counterproductive defense mechanisms problem denial, information avoidance, 
um, as well as a sense of, of powerlessness. Turning to hope, um, as a discrete emotion, hope is understood as the emotional experience of perceiving the possibility of a positive future outcome. Um, what Lazarus describes as fearing the worst, but yearning for better and believing the wished for improvement is possible. Um, Amy Chadwick, who has done some important work on hope appeals in the context of climate change, argues that hope is um, evoked by appraisals of a future outcome that are consistent with one's goals, possible but not certain, um, personally important and imagined as leading to a better future. Um, and she sees hope as associated with an approach action tendency such that hope will stimulate actual or, or preparatory action toward achieving some desired outcome. Um, somewhat differently, Snyder's hope theory, which comes out of um, positive psychology, um, uses a, a cognitive model um, and, and defines hope as the perceived capability to derive pathways to desired goals um, and then motivate oneself via uh, what he calls agency thinking to use those pathways. And so according to Snyder, hope consists of three components, a positive future goal, which is what we want to happen, um, pathway thinking, which is our perceived ability to find ways or routes or mechanisms to reach our goal, um, and then agency thinking, which is our perceived capacity to motivate oneself to use those pathways. Um, and so Snyder sees hope as a motivational force that can engage people in solving problems. In all of these formulations, there's a close relationship between hope and efficacy beliefs, or the belief that our actions can bring a desired outcome to fruition. Um, which suggests that efficacy information may be an important way to evoke hope, um, as well as to make fear appeals more effective, as I mentioned previously. And so I'm going to talk a lot more about efficacy in, in just a moment. Um, there is some evidence that hope can be motivating in a climate change context, um, yet recent research makes a, a really important distinction between constructive or problem-focused hope, which reflects a belief in human capacity to address climate change and is positively related to things like collective action and political engagement with climate change versus hope based on denial about the seriousness of climate change or false hope, a kind of a wishful thinking that the situation will improve on its own um, or emotion-focused coping where, where hope is used to ward off uh, negative feelings of despair. Um, and these three latter uh, forms of hope do not motivate action. Um, and, and in the case of false hope, it's been found to be negatively related to support for climate policy and intentions to take political action. And so it's important to keep in mind that not all forms of hope are created equally. And so I want to talk now about ongoing research um, with my colleague Saul Hart from the University of Michigan. Um, and we have been um, working for a, about a decade or so, and, and we've been interested in, in figuring out how climate change is presented in the news, um, in the news media, in ways that might stimulate hope and fear, um, and how this affects the likelihood that people will become politically engaged with climate change. Um, and in addition to the ideas about hope and fear that I, I just described, one of the theories that we drew from when conceptualizing our research was the extended parallel process model, which emphasizes the importance of efficacy beliefs when communicating about threats. Um, and so the extended parallel process model, or EPPM, um, was developed by Kim Witt in the 1990s as a way to understand people's reactions to fear-based messages uh, designed to promote behavior change. So using the threat of, of lung cancer, for example, to convince people to quit smoking. Um, and, and so the essence of um, of the EPPM is that it argues um, that effective risk communication requires information about the threat as well as ways to reduce the threat. Um, specifically, people need to feel that they are personally susceptible to a severe threat and that there is an action capable of reducing that threat, which is known as response efficacy, and that they are personally able to carry out that action, which is referred to as self-efficacy. Um, and so if perceived threat is high, but efficacy is low, people engage in what's called fear control, where they attempt to manage their fear 
through maladaptive coping strategies such as defensive avoidance, problem denial, and bias processing. This is why people are concerned about fear appeals in the context of climate change. Um, only when people feel efficacious in overcoming the threat, when both perceived threat and efficacy are high, do they engage in what's called danger control, which um, when they attempt to address the threat um, at hand by adopting, adopting whatever behavior change uh, has been recommended. Um, and so the EPPM is typically applied in the context of health issues. That's where it was developed um, and where it's been studied and applied most extensively. And, and in, in the health domain, the focus is typically on individual behavior change, right? People trying to quit smoking. Um, because engagement with climate change is obviously extends to the political sphere, um, in our research, we adapted the model slightly to incorporate political science concepts of internal efficacy, um, which is very similar to self-efficacy in that it captures um, one's perceived ability to take political action. Like how capable do you feel of calling your congressperson or showing up at a protest, for example? External efficacy, um, which captures the belief that the government and other external actors will be responsive to public demands and public opinion. Um, and then we treat response efficacy as something closer to policy effectiveness. So is the proposed policy or technology or other approach um, that's being advocated capable of actually slowing climate change or reducing its negative impact? And so our initial research involved a content analysis um, of both US broadcast and newspaper coverage of climate change between 2005 and 2011. Um, and we examined the ways in which news outlets discussed climate change um, in terms of its attention to the threat um, or impacts of climate change, which is relevant to fear, and to efficacy information and actions or solutions, which is relevant to hope. And so we manually coded each article in our sample um, for whether it discussed any impacts of climate change um, and whether it discussed actions to address them. Um, for those articles that, that uh, discuss impacts, we coded for the timing and location of the impacts as a way to capture Americans' susceptibility to the threat of climate change. We also coded for how the impacts were framed, that is, whether they were discussed in terms of their consequences for the environment, for public health, for the economy, for national security. Um, for those articles that discuss actions, we coded for whether um, any specific information was provided about the efficacy of those actions. Um, specifically, we, we were interested in whether there were um, examples of positive um, or negative self-external and response efficacy. Um, we also coded for how the actions were framed, um, whether as having uh, consequences for the environment, for public health, for the economy, or national security, as well as whether they were discussed in terms of political conflict, public accountability, and morality. Um, and so I'm going to present the, the results from our study of TV news, um, but the patterns were largely similar in the newspaper coverage that we analyzed. And our, our, our key findings were that even though news stories tended to discuss climate impacts and climate actions in equal measure, in about half of all stories, um, uh, meaning in about half of all stories, um, but they, they were nonetheless much less likely to talk about impacts and actions in the same story. And so this means people were getting information about the threat of climate change without information about what can be done about it, or they were getting information about climate actions without the context to appreciate why those actions are necessary. Um, in terms of specific efficacy information, response efficacy information, which discussed the potential effectiveness of climate actions to actually address climate change, um, was the most common form of efficacy information. Very little attention was paid to self-efficacy or external efficacy. Um, so that refers to information about individuals' abilities to take action and the likelihood that those in power will be responsive. Um, and so we also found that government action was the primary type of action covered in news stories about climate change. Um, and without talking about self or external efficacy, this means that that government action was presented as divorced from public opinion, rather than as a response to calls for action by individuals and advocacy groups. Um, and this is pretty notable because the period that we studied included widespread, widespread public debate over cap and trade policy, 
protests over the Keystone Pipeline, demonstrations at, um, at various climate change conferences. Um, and, and so there were plenty of opportunities um, to cover uh, the role that individuals were playing in, in discourse and um, uh, policy making around climate change, but, but uh, uh, news media tended not to do that. Um, we also found that the threat of climate change was predominantly framed in terms of environmental impacts, whereas actions were primarily presented using a conflict frame, focusing on the fight uh, between different political actors to have various policies implemented, rather than emphasizing any particular benefits of taking action. And so this coverage was not presenting you know, the ways in which our future could be bettered um, by taking action on climate change. It was instead focusing on uh, political balance. Um, and so even if people come to believe that a proposed action could be effective based on the response efficacy information in these, in these um, news stories, the emphasis on conflict gives the impression that um, government will be unresponsive to calls for action and that the likelihood of implementing policies is low, um, which may help explain the findings that I talked about earlier from Krasman and colleagues um, about the public's perceived lack of effectiveness of personal actions and the lack of feasibility of government actions. Um, all told, none of these findings are particularly good from the perspective of public engagement. Um, and so recognizing uh, that these data um, are about 10 years old, um, you might be asking you know, whether climate change coverage in the US has gotten any better. Um, and while I have not studied that myself, uh, Media Matters is a progressive think tank uh, that monitors US news coverage of um, and they found that in 2020 um, on the corporate TV network, so ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox Broadcasting, which is separate from the Fox News cable channel, um, across their morning and evening news programs and their Sunday morning talk shows, just 0.4% of total news coverage was devoted to climate change. Um, and so this is only 380 minutes or just about six hours across the entire year across these, all of these networks and all of their news programs. Um, coverage of climate change on the broadcast networks was the lowest it's been since 2016, perhaps not surprising because we were dealing with a pandemic, pandemic but it, it has never been high um, or much higher than this, um, which, is, which is troubling. But they also found that only about 29% of broadcast news stories about climate change in 2020 mentioned possible solutions to climate change. Um, and, and most of those stories were about Biden's climate plan in the context of the election um, and clean energy technology more broadly. Um, and while there are differences in how we operationalized uh, the focus on climate solutions or actions, um, it's notable that this is lower um, than what we found in our, in our study 10 years ago. Um, so still not uh, sufficient emphasis on, on solutions and, and actions to address climate change. Um, so now I'm going to turn to some of our experimental results uh, that examined whether efficacy and solution-based information in climate change news may help motivate political activism through effects on hope and fear. Um, and so across a series of studies, we looked at how um, different types of efficacy information, so the, the different types I talked about earlier, self, external, response, um, influence policy support and political behavior. Um, and we, we also looked at how news stories about climate impacts um, versus climate actions specifically affected people's sense of hope and fear, and in turn, if and how those emotions drive support for climate mitigation policies and, and behavioral intentions. Um, and so we wanted to see if efficacy messages consistent with the expectations of the extended parallel process model would increase hope while decreasing fear and in turn motivate people to take action to address the threat of climate change. Um, and so we've done a series of online survey experiments that have looked at these relationships. And, and here's an example of um, the stimuli from one experiment where we manipulated the headline and a core content paragraph of a news article uh, to emphasize different types of efficacy information as compared to an article um, that only emphasized the impacts of climate change. Um, here's another study where we manipulated news text to emphasize either 
climate impacts, climate actions, or both impacts and actions, which is what this um, headline and story does. Um, and we also manipulated the image that appeared in the article. Um, imagery is something that has really been understudied in climate change communication, and we were interested to see if action-oriented imagery like the solar panel image um, would increase hope and efficacy and whether uh, more causal or impact focused imagery would increase fear. And so these are the, the images that we used in this study. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about our findings in broad strokes, but I'm, I'm happy to get more into the weeds uh, during the Q&A. Um, what we have found across, uh, again, multiple studies is that emphasizing efficacy and actions to address climate change um, using either news text or visuals, we found that solar panel image was particularly effective, um, increases hope and increases people's um, perceived efficacy. Um, and this is true even among political conservatives. Um, we found that response eff efficacy information, so information about the effectiveness of policies to mitigate climate change was especially resonant among conservatives. Um, in turn, we found that hope and efficacy are important drivers of political activism, of policy support, and of um, energy conservation behavior. Um, we found that hope was especially predictive of policy support among conservatives. Um, however, we also found that emphasizing efficacy and actions decrease fear, as we expected it would, but that fear also contributes to climate supportive attitudes and behaviors although not quite as consistently as hope. Um, you know, as I noted earlier, some scholars have warned that fear-based messaging um, can be counterproductive. And so our research suggests uh, that fear actually can contribute to engagement. And we see really this additive role of both hope um, and fear um, in, in motivating activism and, and policy support. And so this raises the question of how we um, can leverage the hope-inducing effects of efficacy information without reducing the motivational effect um, or motivational factor of fear. Um, and it's a pretty simple answer. Messages should focus on both impacts and actions. Um, and, and in our studies where we where we included a condition that described both climate impacts and actions, we found that that increased hope, but didn't decrease fear relative to only talking about climate impacts or climate threat. Um, and so hope and fear um, both need to be part of a climate engagement strategy. However, efficacy messaging, um, despite it, its important role in potentially cultivating hope um, about climate change, there's not much, much information about it, um, either image-based or, or text-based in the current news media environment, um, which is something that I argue needs to change, which is why I'm encouraged by efforts like that, that How to Save a Planet podcast that I, I described earlier. And so now I'm gonna switch gears a bit and, and talk about another potential media source of hope about climate change, which is comedy. Um, and so I published a book last year um, with my co-author Katie Boron Chateau um, that explores the role that comedy can play in activism around social justice issues. Um, and we include an entire chapter that focuses specifically on um, the role of comedy in climate change uh, communication. Um, and so as we know, climate change communication is plagued by a number of challenges, some of which I've, I've talked about um, today. You know, climate change itself can be, can feel both impersonal and overwhelming. It's politically polarizing um, and news coverage often focuses either on political conflict and scientific uncertainty or on you know, pessimistic doom and gloom scenarios, um, which can be, um, as I've, I've mentioned, immobilizing and, and overwhelming, if not balanced with more hopeful narratives. Um, and so comedy, which you might not typically think about as a way to communicate about serious issues like climate change, actually might really be able to play an important role here. Um, so first, it, it provides a way to engage public interest and attention. Um, comedy is fun, it's enjoyable, and, and by creating an entertaining media experience, it can draw people into an issue that they might not otherwise care about or think deeply about, um, while also making climate change seem more relatable and connected to everyday concerns. Um, second, we know that humor elicits positive emotions, so comedy may be a way um, to counterbalance some of the fatigue and despair associated with uh, climate change by increasing hope and building efficacy. Um, finally, comedy might be a way to disarm audiences. Um, 
Past research has found that comedy about political issues can reduce message counter arguing. Um, essentially, when people process comedy, they're focused more on getting the joke and understanding the humor and, and getting that payoff of laughter that they don't have resources left over to critique the message. And that can open the way to persuasion. And so numerous comedians and comedy shows um, are starting to focus on climate change um, in ways that might help elevate the issue in public consciousness. So satirical news programs like Last Week Tonight with John Oliver, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, Full Frontal with Samantha Bee, um, Saturday Night Live have focused on climate change. Um, and some of my older research has found that satirical news programs can help promote attention to science and environmental issues, including climate change among audiences, um, especially those with less formal education for whom keeping up with science issues and making sense of them might be especially daunting. And so comedy makes science more accessible. Um, sitcoms like the, si the Simpsons, Modern Family, 30 Rock, Superstore, all have included climate related storylines. Um, sitcoms in particular, have the potential to reach unexpected audiences who don't ordinarily seek out information about climate change with funny, relatable arguments um, for taking climate action. And so in addition to these examples in entertainment programs, we also see environmental advocacy organizations intentionally incorporating comedy into their communication strategy as a way to promote action. Um, and there are, are two examples in particular that we wrote, wrote about in the book. Um, in 2016, the progressive advocacy organization NextGen America, which was um, founded by billionaire and former US presidential candidate Tom Steyer, developed a, a five episode web documentary series called Spotlight California. Um, and the series that they, they decided to have the series hosted by a comedian, um, Kieran Duell. Um, and she, in the, in the series, she tours California, chronicling how the state's environmental problems such as drought and pollution um, are impacting residents. Um, and she intersperses these sort of lighthearted comic moments with the documentary's otherwise very serious fact-filled content. Um, and, and we interviewed uh, Next Gen America's former VP for digital, their creative director who oversaw the project. Um, and, ex and he explained how they really saw comedy as one of the best ways to make wonky policy issues more interesting and relatable to their young target audience. Um, similarly, the documentary's producer told us that she saw comedy as a way to make the environmental movement seem more fun and less didactic and, and less preachy so that it becomes something that people want to join. Um, another example is from Defend Our Future, uh, which is the millennial focused environmental advocacy arm of the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, and in 2016, they partnered with Funny or Die um, to create a video called Old People Don't Care About Climate Change, um, which features a group of older actors and comedians who you see here, um, seemingly delighting in the fact that they don't need to care about climate change. Um, so this is Ed Asner, one of the, the comedians saying, you know, worry about climate change, it's an after I'm dead problem. I still have while I'm alive problems like uh, finding comfortable shoes. Um, and so, so the video uses satire to mock the sentiment that old people or older people don't need to care about climate change because they won't be around to see its effects. Um, and so the comedy calls attention here to the generational cleavage around climate change. Today's youngest citizens will bear the brunt of a changing climate um, and, and they tend to worry about climate change more than older generations, yet they vote at starkly lower rates. Um, and so the video ends with a serious call to action. Old people don't care about climate change. That's why you have to vote climate. Um, and so it used humor um, to both grab attention and to help empower people, young people, in the lead up to the 2016 election. And um, you know, by the standards of uh, social media metrics, it was, it was pretty effective. Um, it got more than six, six and a half million uh, views on Facebook and 94,000 shares, um, which is it's pretty significant for a climate change focused uh, video. Um, and, and so the video was created as part of Defend Our Future's broader strategy to motivate young people to not only turn out to the polls, but also to prioritize climate um, when voting. Um, and, they, and they do this work through field-based voter registration drives, as well as um, creative media efforts like this one. 
Um, and so the organization really saw this video as a way to make their name more recognizable um, and create goodwill and ultimately help support their voter registration effort. Um, uh, just as sort of an aside, Defender Future has experimented with a lot of unconventional messaging strategies, including comedy, and, and their founding director um, talked to us about the challenges of trying to find the balance between the funny in this case and what scientists at their parent organization, the Environmental Defense Fund, would say is okay, um, which is a significant challenge in these kinds of collaborations between uh, comedians. Um, and advocacy groups that it worked out um, okay in this case. And so inspired in part by that Defend Our Future video, um, we conducted a messaging experiment to better understand how these kinds of popular marketplace approaches um, to comedy from uh, Funny or Die specifically um, may work to engage and mobilize audiences around climate change. And so I'm gonna wrap up by talking um, through that study. In, in detail. Um, and so we tested the effects of two funnier die sketches that were broadly similar, um, but differed in the targets of their humor. One was politically explicit, the other was not. So the, the first video we, we um, tested was the old people don't care about climate change uh, sketch, which I, which I just talked about, and that was our not politically explicit condition. Um, the second comedy video was called Climate Change Denial Disorder, or CCDD. Um, which also satirizes people who aren't concerned about climate change, but does so in a more politically targeted way. So the video parodies a direct-to-consumer pharmaceutical ad. Um, it opens with a voiceover narrator um, asking, you know, does your parent, grandparent, or political representative uh, suffer from climate change denial disorder? Um, and then it goes on to, to explicitly call out the 56% of Republicans in Congress who have been severely infected with CCDD. Um, the voiceover identifies US uh, Republican senators and representatives who reject climate science by name while their names and state affiliations also scroll in text on the screen. Um, and so obviously much more politically explicit than the old people don't care video. Um, but both videos end with a call to action um, that highlights the importance of political engagement with climate change. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the old people video encouraged uh, viewers to vote, whereas CCDD urges viewers to help Republicans in Congress who suffer from CCDD, arguably by voting them out. Um, and so we were interested in how these comedy videos compared to a serious news video um, from CNN about the impacts of climate change, as well as to a funny non-climate video also from Funny or Die, which served as our control group. Um, and so we randomly assigned participants um, in our experiment, it was an online, another online um, uh, survey experiment, to watch one of these videos. Um, and then we asked them questions about their perceived efficacy, um, external efficacy, um, how much they thought they could influence what the government does on climate change. We asked them about how important climate change was to their vote choice in the 2018 election, which is um, when we conducted the study. We asked them how likely they were to discuss and share information about climate change, um, which we refer to as discursive action, and how likely they were to take political action like attend a protest or, or sign a petition. And then we also asked them about their emotions, about um, how much hope and fear they felt in response to the video how much they enjoyed the video um, and how much they counter argued or disagreed with ideas in the video. Um, and so I'm just gonna quickly walk through our results. Um, in terms of effects on political engagement, we found that the videos were effective, but in, in different ways. Um, so compared to the control condition, the old people video represented by that third bar there, um, increased people's efficacy beliefs or their sense that they can make a difference on climate change. Um, we found that the CCDD video, um, the black bar, increased people's intentions to discuss and share information about climate change, that's discursive action, um, and also made them um, say that climate change was more important to their vote. Um, the comedy videos, however, did not differ from one another um, or from the CNN video in their effects on these outcomes, and we didn't um, see any effects of the videos on people's willingness to take high level political actions like protesting or volunteering. Um, in terms of effects on processing variables or our mediators, we found that the two comedy videos significantly boosted enjoyment and hope 
relative to the news video while decreasing fear. Um, we also found that the comedy videos, especially the CCDD video, increased counter-arguing. Um, and this was somewhat unexpected given um, what I mentioned earlier, what we know from prior research about comedy reducing counter-arguing, um, but this is likely due to the partisan nature of the humor in the CCDD video um, and the use of irony in the old people video. So we had some qualitative data that showed that people were tending to argue against the idea that old people really don't care. Um, we then modeled the indirect effects of the comedy videos um, on political engagement through the, the emotions, um, enjoyment, and, and counter-arguing. And we were able to show that comedy's effects on political engagement work through its effects on hope and enjoyment, whereas the effects of news on political engagement work through fear. Um, and so this is a diagram of our findings, and um, I know it's a, it's a bit complicated looking. Um, the solid line arrows indicate a positive relationship between variables and dashed lines indicate a negative relationship. Um, and, and what it ultimately shows is that comedy boosted hope and enjoyment and those variables in turn increased political engagement. So if you follow, um, for example, the orange lines, you can see that both comedy videos increased hope compared to the news video. Um, and then that hope in turn was positively related um, to efficacy, to climate vote importance, to discussion and political action. Um, and so by sparking hope, comedy can indirectly stimulate political engagement. Um, and I'll note here again, as in our, the research I discussed earlier, we find that hope is a consistent motivator of these various political engagement outcomes. In contrast, the dotted red lines um, show that comedy decreased fear um, compared to the news video. Um, and fear also is a positive driver of climate vote importance of discussion and political action. Um, and so that CNN video about climate impacts helped boost political engagement by increasing people's fear about climate change. Um, and so we can see that comedy and news work through different mechanisms in terms of how they're engaging the public with climate change. Um, and so overall, these results show that, that hope and enjoyment provide indirect pathways through which comedy can increase engagement, whereas counter-arguing plays an inconsistent role. Um, the arousal of fear is a benefit of, of the serious news messaging in this case. Um, we also examined whether people's political identity affected how they responded to the videos. Um, and here we found no differences um, on the direct effects of comedy on our political engagement outcomes. So in other words, the comedy videos overall were equally effective in shifting attitudes and intended behaviors, regardless of one's politics. Um, however, viewers' political orientation did influence the effect of the videos on enjoyment, on hope, and counter-arguing, although not on fear. Um, and so I'll show you those results quickly. So the, the comedy in the CCDD video, which remember attacked um, climate deniers and called out Republicans, was less likely to be enjoyed by conservative Republicans. They didn't enjoy it any more um, than the news video, although they did enjoy the old people video as much as moderate independents and, and liberal de uh, Democrats did. Um, they were also more likely to counter argue the CCDD video um, than the politically neutral comedy uh, in, in the old people video. Um, we also found that the effects of comedy on hope only occurred among liberal Democrats. Um, and we're not quite sure why this is. Um, one reason may be that left-leaning audiences who already are predisposed to care about climate change may be more likely than other groups to see comedy as something that will inspire collective action around climate change, thus giving them more reason for hope. Um, if we look at how political orientation moderates those indirect effects that I showed you earlier, we see that the old people videos indirect effects on engagement um, worked for all three political groups, um, whereas the CCDD videos positive effects um, as a result of enjoyment only worked for moderate independents and liberal Democrats. Um, the indirect effects of both comedy videos through hope were only significant among liberal Democrats and, and the indirect effects through counter arguing also only significant um, among liberal Democrats. Um, so I know that was a little bit uh, in the weeds. Um, and so there are, uh, you know, some, some big picture takeaways that we can um, take um, from these results. First, comedy about climate change can boost political engagement. 
um, but it's neither monolithic in its influence nor a one size fits all approach. Um, and so we found really that the effects depend on the type of comedic message as well as on the outcome um, in, in question. So the old people video, which focused on empowering young people did seem to have that effect by increasing efficacy beliefs. Whereas that the CCDD video, which called out Republican lawmakers had more of an effect on provoking discussion and emphasizing the importance of climate change as a voting issue. Um, we also see that even though comedy and news do not differ in their direct effects on political engagement, they work through different mechanisms. Um, and so this suggests that within the broader media ecosystem, comedy can serve a, a, a distinct, albeit complementary role to more informational news-based discourse about climate change. Um, and so again, you know, we see that comedy engages audiences with climate change indirectly through its effects on hope and enjoyment, um, whereas news works through effects on fear. Um, and, and this is really consistent with the work I, I presented earlier, my work with Saul Hart, which has found that both fear and hope motivate climate activism and policy support. Um, and so this again tells us that the availability of both serious threat focused and more positive hopeful messages is really important for public engagement. Um, at the same time, um, Comedy does not work identically for all audiences. Um, its effects really depend on individuals' political predispositions in combination with the political explicitness of comedy. Um, a lot of comedy about climate change tends to go after the, the low-hanging fruit, making fun of people who don't believe in climate change. And this is not an, an effective way of, of um, creating a broad tent that pulls in diverse audiences. Um, but you know the fact that the old people video was capable of engaging audiences is, is a really and conservative audiences is a really important finding um, in that it suggests that comedy about climate change can appeal across the political spectrum when it doesn't focus on attacking climate dismissives. Um, so even the most dissenting audiences, conservative Republicans can enjoy comedy uh, that supports taking action on climate change as long as they're not being attacked by the comedy. Um, and, and so overall, we're able to learn from this study um, that comedy works to engage audiences with climate change by creating entertaining, enjoyable media experiences that inspire hope. Um, and you know, in our, in our book, we found very similar things um, in other studies that we conducted around the issues of poverty and another related to attitudes towards refugees. Um, so comedy's effects on hope and, and, and the way that it mobilizes um, is generalizable across a number of, of serious social justice issues. Um, and, and you know, people often incorrectly assume that comedy, because it's funny and entertaining, is inappropriate for communicating about serious issues like climate change or that it can serve as a distraction from important problems. Um, but our research shows that it's precisely because comedy is funny and entertaining that it's capable of engaging and motivating people around challenging issues like climate change. Um, you know, it pulls people in, it creates a positive emotional connection um, while also providing a powerful form of critique, um, which can in turn inspire engagement and action. It by no means should be the only, you know, mode of, of trying to engage uh, uh, people and the general public with climate change, but it certainly can be an important tool in the toolbox. Um, and so, you know, by way of, of wrapping up, you know, the research that I've discussed today points to the value of both hope and fear-based uh, messaging in climate change communication, but there is a lot that we don't know. Um, and so I wanted to just offer up a few questions that I think are, are interesting and important for future research. Um, you know, first, what are some of the boundary conditions of the mobilizing effects of hope and fear in climate activism? Are there certain groups for whom or certain contexts in which hope and or fear are more or less mobilizing? Um, what are the long-term effects of hope and fear-based messaging? We don't really know anything about this. You know, for example, just continued emphasis on the threat of climate change lead to desensitization or burnout, which is something that um, you know, some, some have been concerned about. Um, what kinds of media messages foster constructive hope versus the less productive forms of hope that I mentioned at the start of my talk, false hope, hope as emotional coping, hope as, den as denial? Um, for example, that, that study that I mentioned earlier by Jennifer Marlin and colleagues found that constructive hope is most mobilizing 
when people also feel some constructive doubt, meaning when they recognize that humans aren't doing enough or acting quickly enough to avoid the, the most severe impacts of climate change. So is it just as important to convey obstacles and setbacks to climate action as it is to convey the, the efficacy of those solutions? Um, we also need to know more about the effects of these media and messages in field settings, um, including in non-news contexts. Um, so most of my work has focused on news and journalism. Um, these variables might operate differently in, in the context of activist communication, for example, um, as well as understanding the effects on actual behavior instead of just behavioral intention. Um, so I will, I will stop there and I'm happy to, to take your questions. Thank you very much. 